think directly coming to the topic, uh, majority of our patients are happy after a total hip. It's not like total knee because total knee, I think almost 20% of our patients are unhappy, which is evidence-based medicine. Uh, total hip, almost all of us, all of the patients are happy, excepting 2 to 5%. So to assess how to, uh, how to sort of uh, uh, go about when the patient is not happy and the patient, he or she is complaining about the pain. So again, uh, I reiterate, THR has been called as the operation of century. It has 95% survival reaching to about 20 years post-surgery. Now, as we have seen in the previous lectures, there are a lot of permutations and combinations, cemented, uncemented stems, cemented, uncemented cups, dual mobility cups, various bearings. That's why, because of the variety of prosthesis and fixation modalities employed in the THR, evaluation of a patient with a painful hip arthroplasty can be really, really tricky. So identifying the source of pain in painful hip arthroplasty is extremely important so that you can formulate your treatment and you can offer relief of pain to that particular patient. Again, the assessment and treatment of the patient is difficult as, as always, you know, he or she was promised to be pain free following up that particular index operation and unfortunately he is not. So let us come to the common causes of pain. I think uh, in the decreasing order of importance, they are infection fractures, greater trochanteric bursitis, ileosoas impingement, obviously a radiating pain because majority of the elderly patients or middle-aged patients, they have degenerative spine disease, especially lumbar spine disease and uh, lumbar canal stenosis. Then limb length discrepancy, I think Dr. Bende is going to talk about that uh, in detail. Then as the time goes by, after the index surgery, after about say five years or seven years, uh, aseptic loosening of the cup or stem or both and uh, uh, unfortunately some of the patients despite doing everything right uh, they land up with something called as a craps uh, that is uh, complex regional pain syndrome. So infection I think all of us know means if it happens immediately after the operation the diagnosis is easy because there are symptoms and signs there is a prolonged discharge from the operating wound. Uh, I personally have a very low threshold uh, to open the hip do a radical debridement DAIR means uh, debridement antibiotic uh, and retain the prosthesis if it is stable to begin with. Uh, there is a local rise of temperature and tenderness, elevated ESR and CRP. Uh, hip movements are painful. That is the classical sign of a, a, a hip a sort of infected hip. Or if it becomes an acute hematogenous infection afterwards, you know, like a delayed infection then a well-functioning hip will suddenly become painful and there will be a decreased range of motion. That is pathognomic of a late onset infection. Obviously, the X-rays will show progression of the radiolucent lines around the prosthesis and the cement mantle. Sometimes you may see endosteal scalloping also. PET scans and WBC labeled uh, nuclear scans are also of help. They show the increase in the uptake. The most important thing to do is to take the patient to the operation theater, paint and drip as if we are going to do a primary hip and aspirate the hip joint and send it to a good laboratory. Now there are a lot of values being quoted but I think the general consensus is if you get a frank pus obviously the diagnosis is straightforward but even if the synovial fluid or the hip fluid shows the WBC count of about 1,700 or 1,800 per high power field and if there is a neutrophil preponderance, that is more than 90% of the white cells are neutrophils, then most likely you are dealing with the infection. Second thing is fractures, uh, more common on the femoral side, uh, again more common with the uncemented stems because you need to really uh, impact them, hammer them uh, uh, quite, quite substantially. Uh, Vancouver classification, uh, uh, the type AG and AL, G is greater trochanter, L is lesser trochanter. So always look for the calcal fracture, means there are various uh, uh, very fantastic names being attributed to these calcar fractures that it's yawning of the calcar or uh, you know um, mild fracture of the calcar but I think be very careful, do a prophylactic wiring intraoperatively if you suspect a calcar fracture. Fractures of the calcar may be associated with sinking and loosening of the uncemented stem especially in the elderly patients or uh, the patients where the bone quality is not good. It can be easily diagnosed with plain X-ray and CT. Anterior thigh pain, especially on the lateral X-ray, if your tip of the prosthesis is touching the anterior cortex of the femur, the, as I think Dr. Kasodekar had said that almost 10 to 15 percent of the patients with uncemented hip may have an anterior thigh pain. Again, it is seen in uncemented hips with improper placement in the lateral pain, causes tip of the stem touching the anterior cortex of the femur. 
Greater trochanteric bursitis, classically the patient has local pain and tenderness at the greater trochanteric area. Local ultrasound and MRI is the investigation of choice, usually responds to anti-inflammatory medicines and physiotherapy. Iliosios impingement, again, if your cup version is not correct or if you are putting a too much larger jumbo cup, it may cause irritation of the iliosios anteriorly and typically the patient has a groin pain which uh, sort of gets aggravated whenever there is a movement of the hip, especially the extension of the hip. Radiating pain from the spine, lot literature has been written recently about this. There, are, there will be symptoms of neurogenic claudication or uh, uh, you know, radiculopathy. There will be a decrease in the sensation or hypoesthesia in the alpha S1 dermatome. Again, X-ray and MRI will pinch the diagnosis along with the classical signs and symptoms. Limb length discrepancy, uh, a very hot topic, especially in North America. Fortunately, it's not that much uh, sort of... Uh, uh, litigious issue in our country, but seen in uncemented hip, for some reason, I think the uncemented hip replacement is more associated with the limb length discrepancy than the cemented hip. Lengthening of the operated leg puts the ipsilateral abductor muscles under stretch and they may produce pain, especially on ambulation. Aseptic loosening usually you, uh, happens after three to five years or ten, uh, seven to ten years after the primary THR. Pain occurs mainly on ambulation and movements of the hip. Rest pain is usually absent if you are dealing with a painful hip because of the loosening or aseptic loosening. X-rays and CT scan are of use for this particular diagnosis. Complex pain, regional pain syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. You everything, rule out everything, and still if the patient is not happy or if they are, he or she is having a pain, then probably you need to involve a pain consultant or your colleague who specializes in pain consultant and uh, maybe give something like a pregabalin or a duloxetine and... Uh, various other things they employ. So what is the evidence-based medicine? As we, as we speak nowadays in the 20, 30, 21st century, a fantastic paper by Paproxky from uh, Rush Medical Center, Chicago. They analyzed 201 painful hips. Now 26.4% of them, they had a periarticular pain because of trochanteric bursitis or iliosoas tendinitis and ischial tuberosity tendinitis. Heterotrophic ossification, not very common in our country. Then 24.4% of them, they had a projected pain coming from the spine. Where was associated with the pain in about 20% of patients. Loosening accounted for almost 20% of patients with a painful hip. Material problems, metal on metal, I think that is also now out because nobody is using it. And trunionosis was responsible for almost 8.5% of the painful hips. Chronic infection, late onset infection was responsible for 3% of patients of pain in their series. Instability means subtle dislocation or instability was responsible for 1.5%, limb length discrepancy about 1.5% and CRPS was almost about 1%. So again, uh, I think uh, this is a flow chart uh, one can go about. As we can see, if you see a painful patient with a, in the same paper, this flow chart is there. Painful hip, first rule out infection. If the infection is ruled out, then rule out the extraarticular causes which are coming from the spine. If that is also ruled out, then see for the periarticular causes like trochanteric bursitis, iliosios impingement. If that is also ruled out, then see for the loosening or wear. If that is ruled out, then the lower possibilities like metal problems or metallosis and CRPS are there. So this is a sort of a decision tree which very nicely they have uh, depicted in that particular paper. So I think uh, I, I thank you for your attention.